Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm bringing you another really great DIY project and I'm gonna be showing you guys how to make floater frames in this video. So floater frames are like these frames here behind me, this one and this one here and this one right here. So the reason why they are called floater frames is because your piece of art or print or whatever you're framing looks like it's floating within the frame. So this tutorial is going to be really great for artists looking to frame their work in preparation for selling or just for hanging, but it's also great for anybody just looking to hang maybe a piece of artwork that you bought or a print that you bought or anything like that. And they're really simple to make using this corner molding that you can get at your local hardware store. Normally they sell it by the foot. This one I did purchase from my local hardware store for $3.87 Canadian, but you may be able to get it a little bit cheaper if you check out a local uh, specialty lumber store. At least that has been my experience when shopping for molding. They do tend to have slightly better pricing on that. Um, so these frames are really great for framing just about any kind of artwork you want. You can frame artwork on that's painted um, on these types of 1 8 inch panels similar to uh, this one here or the ones that are behind me. Those are all 1 8 inch panels. Um, if you have 1 quarter inch, yes, a quarter inch, a quarter inch panel and you can frame both of those using this type of frame and you can also frame the traditional style um, I think it's three quarter inch canvases using this style of frame that I'm going to show you and I will and I will show you guys how to do both options in this tutorial. So now that I've explained all that let's jump right into the tutorial. Alright so the first thing you'll need to do if you haven't already is measure the piece of art you'll be framing. In this tutorial, I'll be framing this small oil painting that's painted on a six inch square panel. So you'll see me only measuring the width since I know that it's square, but your piece of art may not be square. So be sure to measure both the length and the width of your art piece. To create the floating effect, you'll need to add one eighth of an inch on either side length and width. So for example, my painting is six inches, so I'll add one eighth of an inch to either side and that equals an extra one quarter inch total. So I'll be using six and one quarter inch as my measurement. Remember that if your art isn't square, you need to make this calculation for both the width and height of your piece. No matter what size you're working with though, you'll always want to add the same amount to your dimensions this will create that one eighth of an inch space between your frame and artwork, creating that floating illusion. So even if your piece is 20 inches by 24 inches, you'll always add a quarter inch to each, making your measurements 20 and a quarter inch and 24 and a quarter inch. Got it? All right, let's move on. Next, take your piece of corner molding and make your first cut to get your 45 degree angle. So you'll need to adjust your miter saw to move the cutting angle to 45 degrees, pivoting it towards the left for this cut, as you see me doing here. Then make sure to relock the blade in place, that's very important, and then simply cut the end off of your corner molding. Now that you've got your starting 45 degree angle, Measuring from the inner vertex or point of the frame edge, mark with a pencil that measurement you calculated earlier. The width of your artwork plus a quarter of an inch. So for me, like I said, that's six and a quarter inches from that inner vertex. Make sure that that line is nice and visible and you can put an X on the side of that line that you're going to be cutting on. So now before making this next cut, you're going to need to pivot your saw blade toward the right to position it at the opposite 45 degree angle. Then you'll want to line your blade up to the left of the line you just marked on your molding. That's why you mark the X. So you know what side of the line to cut on. You'll want to cut directly beside the line and not on the line to account for the width of the blade. Once you've got everything lined up, return the saw blade back up to its default position and then proceed to start your saw and make your cut.
Once your blade goes through your wood, it's a good idea to let the blade slow back down before lifting it back up. And now you've got the first side of your frame cut. And you can see right here how that cut lines up just next to that pencil line. So now you'll need to pivot your saw blade back to the 45 degree mark on the left side to cut another small piece off the end of your molding. And this will prepare you to start your next frame edge. And now you simply follow the directions given to measure and cut the remaining pieces of your frame in that same way. So now you should have all four pieces to make up your frame. As I said early on, if your artwork is not perfectly squared as mine is, you won't have four pieces of the exact same length. You'll have two pairs of different lengths. Now lay out your pieces appropriately to create your frame. And to fix the frame pieces together, you'll need two things. First, a glue. You can use wood glue or you can use plain white multi-surface glue. Just make sure it says it's good for gluing wood and it's not just for paper. In cases like this where it's not a large piece of furniture being glued that will get a lot of wear and tear, white glue will work just as well as wood glue. So I'm going to use my multi-surface white glue since this quick express drying wood glue I have dries way too fast and it doesn't leave me enough time to reposition my frame pieces if I need to. The other thing you're going to need is this handy band clamp that allows you to easily clamp miter joints perfectly square. This band clamp only cost me $10 at Canadian Tire so it's not a huge purchase. And if you aren't in Canada, you can try your local hardware store or you can find one online. Alternatively, you may be able to find tutorials for other ways of clamping miter joints online. So you'll just want to position the band clamp around your frame pieces with one clamp corner at each corner of your frame. And once you have it in place, tighten it enough to keep your pieces together, but so that you can still easily pick your frame pieces out. Now pick up one frame piece from its position and add glue to each end, then put it back in place. Next, pick up the opposite frame edge, add glue to each end, and position it back in place. Now pull the strap on your band clamp to tighten it and squeeze all the frame pieces together. Before locking the clamp, you want to check your frame pieces and readjust them if you need to to make sure that all the edges and seams are lined up perfectly. Now with the band clamp strap snugged up by hand, lock the band in place and then continue to tighten the clamp using that twistable handle at the bottom. Once the straps around the frame don't have any give to them so they feel nice and rigid, your clamp is nice and tight. At this point you want to remove any excess glue that may have squeezed out around the miter joints and then you can set your frame aside to dry. For this next part, you'll need a small block of wood, which you can buy a piece of this lumber at the hardware store or a lumber store when you get your corner molding to make your frame. I believe this comes in set lengths, but some stores may allow you to buy it by the foot as well. Now, if you're framing a piece of art that is on a traditional one inch deep wooden stretcher frame, you won't need these little blocks at all. So you can skip to the part of the video that I've indicated on screen. In this tutorial, as I said, I'm framing a 1 8 of an inch thick panel. So I've worked out that I need to measure and cut four blocks that are 3 quarters of an inch wide. Now if you're framing a 1 quarter inch thick panel, you're going to need to measure and cut each of your blocks to be 5 8 of an inch wide. And you can see here that these blocks are going to lift your artwork so that it will sit flush with the front of your frame and why you have to change the size of your blocks according to how thick your artwork is and also why if you're framing a traditional stretch canvas you don't need these blocks at all. It will already sit flush with the front of your frame as is. Alright so next since you'll need to be handling the artwork you want to lay down a soft cloth to protect the artwork from scratches or other damage while you're working. Lay the artwork face down on the cloth. 
So ultimately what you're going to be doing is gluing one of these blocks to each side of the back of your artwork. But I feel like it's possible that you or the person who buys your artwork may want to change the frame to something different in the future. And just pulling these glued blocks off can damage your panel as you can see from this test that I did. And that's really not something that you want, especially if the piece of art you're framing is an original piece of art. So in order to make these blocks easier to remove from the back of the art, if needed, you want to cut four strips of plain paper to glue under the blocks. A tip is that you can also use really thin but really well adhering double sided tape if you want. This is just a cheap and simple option. I've tested both of these options and they both seem to work well. Once the paper strips are glued and dried, use your ruler to find and mark the center of all four edges. Then, before gluing the wood blocks over the paper strips, measure and mark center lines on the sides of each of your blocks. Now, use the lines on the paper and the lines on the block to center the blocks perfectly. Make sure when adding your glue to do so sparingly in this case because you want to make these pieces as easy to remove without damage as possible. A little dab will do. And be sure they're also lined up along the edge of the artwork. You don't want them hanging out over because you don't want them to be visible once everything's put together. And you'll also want to be sure to glue these the right way around. Once your blocks are glued in place, set your artwork aside to dry. Now that your frame is fully dry, you can loosen the band clamp to release the frame. With the ruler placed under the edge of your frame with the numbers still visible, find and mark the center of each side of your frame on the frame itself. Then, weaving your ruler into the inside of the frame, measure and mark the center of the inside width of each of your frame sides. These two intersecting center lines on each side will give you the direct center spot. Mark it with a circle. You'll be using number six screws that are half an inch long for this project, so you'll want to prepare your drill with a 1 8 of an inch drill bit to accommodate for the entire screw shaft, including the thread. Now create a surface for drilling on and position your frame on it. Then drill a hole all the way through your frame on each one of the four center marks we just made. Next, once the glued blocks are fully dried in place on the back of your artwork, you'll now position your artwork inside your frame. Now you'll need a deck of playing cards which you will be using as spacers to perfectly position your artwork in the center of the frame. And these are perfect because we know that each card is exactly the same thickness. So start by placing a stack of six or seven cards in the spaces between the artwork and the frame on each side. Then add one card at a time to each stack of cards until each stack is snug and you can't fit any more. Just make sure your stacks have identical amounts or at least that opposite sides have identical amounts. For example, sometimes opposite sides might fit eight cards each while the other opposite sides will fit nine cards. But you never want to have eight cards and then nine cards in the stack directly opposite it. Basically, you want to keep things symmetrical. Another tip, if you're having trouble fitting that one last card in in order to even out opposite stacks, slide the card into the center of the stack instead of trying to fit it in the front or back. It should slide much better between the glossiness of the cards. Now you'll need to create a bit of a platform that you'll be able to sit this on upside down. 
So I'm using two small cans of stain because they fit just inside the perimeter created by the card stacks. Once again, make sure that you cover the surface with a soft cloth since you'll be working with your artwork in the face down position. With your frame piece in place, you'll position your drill fit with a 5 64ths of an inch drill bit inside the holes you drilled into the frame earlier. And now drill holes into the wood blocks attached to your artwork. You'll want to make sure not to drill too deep here, about halfway through the wooden blocks only. These holes are only meant to guide your screws and prevent the wood blocks from splitting since you're going to be screwing into the grain of the wood block, which does make wood prone to splitting otherwise. Once all four holes are drilled, you can remove the cards, disassemble the artwork from the frame, and here you can see the holes we just drilled. Now it's time to sand the frame all over with a finishing sandpaper of about 300 to 400 grit. After sanding, this would be the time to stain, paint, or clear coat your frames and allow them to dry if that's what you want to do. Finally, it's time to assemble everything. Reposition your artwork in your frame, add your stacks of cards back in the spaces around the frame as you did before, and then using an appropriate size and shaped screwdriver, screw your half inch screws through the holes on the back side of your frame. Once your screws are in, you can remove the playing cards and continue to tighten the screws if you need to until the wood blocks are fitting flush against the frame. And you'll be able to see that from the back side. And ta-da! You're finished and you've got a nice floater frame for a lot less since similar floater frames can be quite pricey in stores. Well, that's it for this tutorial guys. I hope that you liked it and if you did, please click the thumbs up below and leave me a comment. Both of those things really help to get my videos out there and seen by more people and really helps my channel grow. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you wanna keep up with all of my latest videos and make sure to click the bell icon once you do subscribe so that you can be notified each time I do upload a new video. And don't forget that if you really did like it, to share it with your friends. I hope you guys all have a super awesome day, and I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!